I was, you know, dabbling with videos here and there. Then I said, F it, I'm going to go all in. So I had to give up everything. My, my house, my family, my visa, just go all in. <laughs> I have just arrived to the bottom of the world, the country of... New Zealand! But here is everything that I like about this country. Go! That's one minute. I will see you tomorrow. Good night. The courage to be disliked means that when you live your truth, you realize that half the world will dislike your truth. My advice to people is don't think about the amount. Think about the time this amount buys you. Being a content creator was an accident. There's a standard, you know, copy paste fit. And we're not that. Eventually, at some point, I'll just be responsible for three things. Making sure the company has enough money, making sure that we're hiring people, and you either want to join such a company or you want to join a company that stands for nothing. The downside of fame, it's getting harder to have the same conversation. <laughs> you know that you got to figure out your escape plan ASAP. You're listening to the Erica Taught Me podcast, the number one business podcast in the U.S., where we talk about entrepreneurship, money, and how to improve your life and achieve success. I'm your host, Erica Kohlberg. I'm a lawyer and personal finance expert with over 20 million followers on social media. Today, I'm interviewing Nasir Yassin. Some people know him as Nas Daily. He's a content creator most notable for his challenge to create over a thousand daily one minute long videos. Nasir walks us through his companies, how he built them, and how he defines success. Keep listening to learn how Nasir made it big and what his next ventures are. I'm Erica Kohlberg, this is Erica Taught Me, and today we're here with Nasir Yassin. So with over 50 million followers online, how do you think your videos are different from others who haven't been able to reach that kind of audience? First of all, Erica, thank you so much for having me. Hello, everybody on video and in audio. Why did my videos succeed while other people's videos failed? I think it boils down to how you talk, right? If you notice, I scream in every video. I have infinite energy in every video. Now, it annoys half the world, but it makes the other half love you. And I think that's part of the reason why Nas Daily grew so, so big, because people are attracted to energy. What percent of that energy is a front for video versus what percent is actually you? Well, Erica, luckily, we know each other outside <laughs> of the videos. And so you are the person to tell if the energy is just in front of the videos or not. But you can be honest. I think your voice is a little louder for video. <laughs> <laughs> and also for podcasts, correct. Yeah. I think I think off camera, I get to see more dimensions of you. Whereas on camera, most people get to see, like you said, the, yeah. this is one minute. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's funny. That was yeah, good. that's correct. That's correct. <laughs> yeah. I Look, it's my job and it's your job and it's everybody's job to show the best one minute of my day. I, 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 nobody needs to see me showering. It's boring. It's 10 minutes of boring stuff. Uh, <laughs> so, so yeah, that's why in the video, it's a little bit higher energy, more to the point. Yeah, it worked. Okay, so take me back to when you started day one out of 1,000 days of video content creation. What was the process behind that? How did you decide to create these 1,000 videos? Yeah, so for those that don't know, Nas Daily started in a different way. It wasn't a weekly thing. It wasn't a yearly thing. It wasn't whenever you feel like it. It was every goddamn day. 1,000 daily torture. And every video took 14 hours to make, to make a one-minute video. You know, the first 100, 200, 250 videos actually didn't work. You know, you couldn't build a business out of this. There's no real success. You're just making videos and they're, you know, performing mediocre, 10,000 views, 10,000 views, 10,000 views. And that's 10,000 Facebook views, which is 10,000 three second views, which is how many real views? Can you guess? Probably 3,000 real views, maybe 2,000 complete views after 200 videos. I mean, that's crazy talk, right? So, you know, I, but I continued. And I think that's the story of Nas Daily is that my commitment to myself is that, you know, I'm going to work four times as hard as anybody else because I'm just not as smart as everybody else. So I'll work harder than everybody else and I'll figure it out. And it worked on day 271. That was your first viral video. Super viral, yeah. Which one was that? It's like in Thailand, like how cheap is Thailand? <laughs> <laughs> nice. Did you know Thailand is very cheap? Thailand is very cheap. And people love that. 
30 million views. Before I launched the video, I was 100,000 followers. After I launched the video, I was 400,000 followers. It was 4X in one day. Wow. To get to the point where you could take 14 hours a day to make one video, you had to have gone straight into being a full-time content creator, Correct. right? Correct. Correct. So what was your job before? It was an engineering position? So I was a software engineer at PayPal. You know, I was, you know, dabbling with videos here and there, wishing I could make videos. Then I said, F it. I'm trying not to curse anymore. F it. I'm going to go from the deep end of the pool. I'm going to go all in. So I had to give up everything. My, my house, my apartment, my friends, my family, uh, my visa, and just really just go all in. And luckily, you know, I was single back then. So I had nothing tying me back. And I had no kids, no girlfriend, nothing. And that was really, really helpful in helping me take that, you know, a big decision. But why is my question? Because I guess PayPal is such an amazing company. I'm sure. Yeah. How much were you making there? 120. 120. That's a great salary. Six for years ago. Anyone in their early 20s. Yeah. What caused you to say, I want to leave that? Yeah. So Erica, you know this better than anybody. The way the world is structured sucks. It's terrible. At almost everywhere you look in the world, if you, if you really analyze the structure of the world, you're going to be like, how is this okay? How is it okay to only retire at 65? That's insanity. How is it okay to sit in front of a computer and not enjoy what you do? It's not okay. It's not okay. How is it okay for me to beg the American government to give me a visa? And they give me a visa by luck. You know, I won the lottery by luck even with a Harvard degree. That's not okay. How is it okay to pay $1,600 for some you know, shitty studio in New York City? That's not okay. So there's a lot of things that are not okay in the world and I just was fundamentally disagreed with them. And that's why I wanted to build my own world, the world I want to live in. And this is the world I'm living in today. And how would you describe that world? What, when you were thinking of, okay, I'm going to quit my job, what was that ideal world you want to, to live in? The ideal world I see is like, you know, especially in media, how many movies does Tom Cruise have to star in? The whole world was watching 20 people, 20 friends give each other roles and money to be in front of the big screen. That's not okay. How many times have we listened to the West telling us what to think, how to think, how to govern, how to live? That's not okay either, right? So Really, my frustration with the world was about not having a voice. And I thought that instead of begging a corporation to give me a voice or begging Hollywood or institutions to give me a voice or even the government to give me a voice, I'm going to find it by myself on the Internet. And I'm going to find people that agree with this voice. And it worked. What were those first days of content creation like? So I was learning. You know, I was learning publicly. This is why for anybody that's like, thinking of doing something, I advise you to learn publicly, not privately. What does it mean to learn publicly? Which it means basically I'm going to create something and instead of critiquing it myself, I'm going to let the world critique it. And so, so I, the first hundred videos, I was like, okay, I'm going to experiment with as many videos as possible. This is really cringe. Upload. This is terrible. Upload. I don't want my family to see me like this. Upload. And that was really important. So self-learning journey for the first 100 days. And then I became better and better and better publicly as well. Who were your people that you were learning from at that time? You know, there's no such thing as originality. So when it comes to making videos or even building companies, you know, the way I like to think about it is, you know, when I build a company or a product today, I basically copy 1% from 100 different people, right? From 100 different people, I take 1% of each person and I have 100% of something unique. But I basically copied 100 times and they call it creativity. There's many ways to call it. So I was actually, you know, every time I go on the internet, I learn 1% from somebody out there and then I mimic them. And I remember even the yellow color, I took it from some other channel. I'm not going to say which. <laughs> <laughs> Don't give them the satisfaction. <laughs> what about the shirt? Was that 100% original? The shirt? There and was give no people such context. Thing. Give people context in the shirt. So for those that don't know, I wear the same shirt for the last five years, right? Every eight months, my shirt changes. My entire wardrobe changes. I have 20 of the same t-shirt. The t-shirt has my life and a percentage associated with it. So 39% life today, which means I'm done with 39% of life, which means I'm one third, more than one third dead. And this is based on my age, based on life expectancy. So I'm 30. I'm supposed to die when I'm 76. 
30 out of 76 is 39%. Actually, Erica, it was my percentage birthday two days ago. So I'm 40% now. Oh, you haven't updated the shirt yet. <laughs> <laughs> Are you waiting for them to come in? or? Yes, they're in the mail. <laughs> How many do you order each time? So I order 25 t-shirts. And the minute those come, I will just get rid of all these t-shirts and then I will just have a new wardrobe. Where do they go? I give them out as gifts. Oh, nice. Yeah. I would like one. Really? Yeah, I'll take one. Of course, I'll give you one. (laughs) Uh, You want used or washed? Washed. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Okay, so once you, before you started finding that success, I assumed the content creation wasn't making you any money for the first year. First two years. First two years. Yes. So that was all running through your savings. So it wasn't making me break even. I only started breaking even at two years. But, you know, I remember after day 10, you know, I got a $200 job offer. Success. You know, hey, can you fly the drone over this slum in Kenya? And I'll give you 200 bucks. I was like, yeah, let's do it. So that was easy. Uh, then I got a consulting job offer, you know, in Nigeria, $3,000 a month for three months. Yes. So I saved money. I saved, you know, I, so I was, I was breaking even roughly after two years. But, you know, here's something I would say. You know, the only reason you're creating content and the only reason I'm creating content is because we were rich before. You were filthy rich before, no, Erica. not that rich. Yes, you were. How much did you have in savings? <laughs> Enough for several months of expenses. Several months or several years? <laughs> no, definitely not several How much? Years. For 40K? More or less. More. Oh my God, 60K? <laughs> exactly 60K? <laughs> say. I, I, but I Erica, honestly nobody can't... cares about that amount. No, I, I do think it matters because I think if I say what it is, everyone's going to say, okay, well, if I have enough, if I have that amount of money, I'll quit my job. So I don't want to say exactly. Yeah, because... do that. No. That's great. If you have that money, <laughs> I, that's exactly what I was about to say. <laughs> so I had 60K in savings, $40,000 in cash, $20,000 in 401k stocks, blah, blah, blah. And for me, $60,000 is enough to live for 12 months in New York without having to get a job. Great. I can bet on myself for one year. That's all I need to figure out a way out. So I did it. Now, the minute I quit my job, I was like, hold on a minute. One year in New York with this money, I can live 10 years in India with this money. (laughs) Let's go to India. Actually, let's go to Kenya first. So I literally started in Kenya. Nas Daily, my career started in Nairobi, Kenya. Then Ethiopia, Addis Ababa. Then Delhi, India, then Nepal. You know, I really went into places that I find exciting, but also that I could afford to train cheaply. That's really important. So anyway, my advice to people is don't think about the amount. Think about the time this amount buys you. That I agree with. I agree with. I thought of it also, whatever amount I did have saved up, I thought of it in terms of how many months could I survive with my current lifestyle. I needed more of a cushion than you did, I think. I needed more than 12 months. That makes sense. That makes sense. Because I didn't think I would find success in a year. I felt like I wanted to give myself two years to find success. And you found it in three months. (laughs) A little longer. Annoying. (laughs) How was it, though, when, you know, it took you two years to reach a point where you could call yourself profitable? That must have been tough. You must have been getting nervous at some point that, wait, what if my money runs out? You know, tough to an extent. There were, you know, 30, 40 days where I was scared. But the truth of the matter is, like, let's call a spade a spade. I was a software engineer. Okay, there's always demand for those. I had a Harvard degree. There's always demand for those just for the brand. And I had friends. I, my advice to people is not to be taking stupid risk. You should always take hedged risks. I hedged my risk by having enough of a war chest, a financial war chest and an education war chest to be able to never be homeless. Right? That's the goal. So when I, you know, when I hit break even, I was like, this is great. I'm, I'm happy. I'm satisfied now. And for me, I was, after two years, I started making the same money I was making at Venmo. $10,000 a month. All I needed to do this forever. And I haven't looked back since then. Okay, so that's, at some point, I know content creation was the way it started. You made a switch. You decided that content creation was not going to be your focus. Building a company was going to be your focus. Yeah. What was the moment that you decided to make that shift? I've been trying to build a company for the last 10 years, right? So being a content creator was an accident. People that look like me and people that look like you, frankly, are not meant to be in Hollywood. What I'm saying is that there's a standard, you know, copy paste fit of of which people make it big on the internet or in real life on TV. And we're not that. So for me, it's an accidental thing. What I really want is to, you know, build a company. Also, if you're a creator, you know, you have a shelf life. It is in the best interest of the platform 
to have re- different people being on top. Like the number one YouTuber 10 years ago is different from the number one YouTuber five years ago. It's different from the number one YouTuber today. Do you really think in 10 years, YouTube is going to give Mr. Beast 100 million views? No. They're going to change that. They're going to tweak something to get new faces in. When you realize that, you know that you got to you gotta figure out your escape plan ASAP. And so now I'm figuring out my escape plan. <laughs> did you see views decline or at what point did you have that eye-opening moment saying, okay, I am going to be irrelevant if I don't create something bigger than my face? Roughly two years ago, uh, three, two to three years ago, I realized that. You know, and I, I even chatted with an executive at a social media company and he was very blunt. I'm not going to say who, I'm not going to say which. He was very blunt. He was, look, it's in our best interest to change people who go viral on the platform. And I was like, that's so rude. That's so mean. But he was right. He was right. You know, my escape plan is, you know, we're still averaging a million new users per month. It's amazing. So if you annualize it, we're annualized 12 million new followers per month. I'm happy about that. I'll be happy with 500K new users per month. You know, my my plan has always been uh, to build a hundred year something, something that lasts for a hundred years. So what is it that could last a hundred years? Well, if you're an accountant, Erica, or you're a lawyer, you were a lawyer, the minute you retire, there is no more law being done. So you're done. And that's ridiculous. So you're like a hamster wheel. The minute you stop running, the wheel stops turning. Real power comes when creating something that turns without you running. And that's called building a company. And that's what my 20-year vision right now is to build an institution of, of NAS, of people. And uh, it's a lot harder than people think. <laughs> <laughs> How much longer do you think you'll be on that hamster wheel before you create something where you, if you left, it would run independently of you? I think 10 more years. I have 10 more years of hamster wheeling. And by then, do you think your face will completely be off the videos as well? Yeah. Look, I don't, I don't want to die into irrelevance. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to be uh, non-influential. So after 10 years, I'm thinking of like, okay, I, I exit the private markets and then I think there will be different things to explore, right? Investing is one of them. Public government is another one of them. That's really exciting. Uh, things that matter, right? That's it. I just want to do things that matter. And so what matters in the world? You know, golf doesn't really matter. Sports, honestly, doesn't really matter that much. Uh, so I really think, you know, private markets and public markets, uh, public uh, service is what matters. And so that's what I see myself doing. So what are you building right now if you were to describe it to people? I'll give you the, the, con- the back, back story. I grew up in a village that is 100% Arab that looks like me. Nearby, there's another village that is 100% Jewish. Not a single Arab lives there. Nearby, there's another village, 100% Arab, 100% Jewish. There's very few villages where I live that are intermixed. And so this is imprinted in my life. I went to Harvard. There is a club that's 100% Asian, another club that's 100% Black. When you look at the world, communities form based on race, gender, culture, and, you know, things that you don't control and religion. That's terrible. You know, communities should form based on interest, based on love, passion, hobbies. And so it is our mission as a company to bring people together. What can we do as a company for the next 20 years to bring a black person and a white person together, to bring a, bring a Jew and an Arab together? Now, you can start a nonprofit, but it doesn't really work that much. So we think the solution is in technology products. We think the solution is in physical products. We think the solution lies in travel and the solution lies in technology. So we're building technology products that enables anybody in the world to start a community, to build a community, to bring 200 people together, 2,000 people together. That's product number one. Product number two will probably be a hotel. It brings people together. Maybe an airline in 10 years. Mm -hmm. It'll bring people together. So, you know, Virgin Air, Virgin, the company, they have one mandate. We look at boring businesses and we make them fun. Well, we have another mandate. We look at products that bring people together and we build them. And so that's that's kind of our mission and that's what we're doing. I love the mission. But what is the product? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Great. What is the product? <laughs> I'm learning how to evade questions. <laughs> um, so the product, I don't want to go into the nitty gritty details, but the product is basically, you know, you know, today, if you want to start a community, you know, you used to be able to start a Facebook group and that's it. Everybody used Facebook. Everybody starts a Facebook group. That's it. But nowadays, not everybody uses Facebook. 
So you start a Telegram group. Then you start a WhatsApp group. Then you start a Discord server. So there's a fragmentation of communities and it's becoming increasingly difficult to actually bring people together in a way that, in a software that makes sense. So NAS.io, what we're building, it's a layer that sits on top of all these platforms that integrates with all these platforms and makes it much easier to link people together without having to do any manual work. It's kind of like boom, 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 jujitsu. And it works amazing, like magic, but it's like, it's like an all-in-one solution to start, run, operate, and monetize a community of people on the internet. Exciting. Yeah. Okay, so two years ago, you had this fear that you were going to become irrelevant. You, need to, you needed to build something bigger than you. And now today, I think you have over 100 employees? 120. 120 employees. Walk me through, like, how do you get from concept to 10 employees? And then how did you get from 10 to 20 and 20 to 100 and 120? So the hardest ones are the first 10. The easiest ones are the last 10. Right? It's, really, it's, it's really exponentially, it gets exponentially easier to get 10 more people. But at the beginning, it's like the first person is bad. The second person is bad. The third person is bad. And then you got to figure out what's your leadership style and you need to attract the right people around you. So the first 10, you know, honestly, we had to cycle through 20 people, 30 people to get 10 to stay. Who were the 10 first key hires or what positions were those? So it was a production company. So it was video editor, project manager, assistant. That's, you know, the basic roles that you'd expect at a media company. And so we built the first 30 people as a media company. Then we started to transition to a tech company. So we started hiring tech people after. And you, you get the people from tech companies, you get the software engineers, the product managers, the designers. Getting all these people together is, honestly, I look back and I'm like, that's impossible. It's so hard. Come think of it. Um, but, you know, you make a lot of mistakes. I made a lot of mistakes. What kind of mistakes? <laughs> you know, you hire the wrong person or you fire the wrong way or you, uh, you make the wrong decision, right? Um, you know, there's, there's many reasons, you know, nobody gets it perfectly. And so I definitely look back at the first year and I'm like, wow, I could have done so much better. I just didn't have the education. Again, this is the whole concept of NAS is to fail publicly. I love to fail publicly. The first hundred videos were publicly failed. Um, and the first, you know, 30 people I failed publicly with them. And you can even see it in the Glassdoor reviews. <laughs> like, ah, this guy doesn't know how to lead a company. And, you know, they're right. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're getting better. What kind of leader do you think you are today? I'm not the best leader. Um, I, I think the closest leader that I think, oh, that makes sense, is like Gordon Ramsay. Because Gordon Ramsay makes it clear to the entire team that we are at war. Yeah, we're making food, but we are at war to deliver the perfect experience to the restaurant attendees. The perfect, the perfect food, the perfect time, the perfect heat. And to do that, you have to go through a lot of stress internally. But for the outside product, it's amazing. And I'd say this is the same on my company. Like internally, it's like, oh, so much stress. This has to be perfect. Why is this not perfect? But the external product, we want it to be a delight to the user. So I really do believe in this whole idea of like, soldiers versus citizens. You know, when you're building a company, you need to tell everybody in the company, you're not a citizen. We don't have a social welfare. We don't none of that. We are soldiers and our citizens are the users, but we're going to go and die to make them happy at the expense of our life and our happiness. And some people are not attracted to that kind of work culture. Some people think, some people say, I'd like to work at a company that's more of a family vibe. And there is nothing wrong with that. For me, I tell people, we're not family. It is hypocritical to call you family member and then fire you the next day or you quit the next day. That's not family. We're an NBA team. We're an army and we have a mission and we're going to fight it because it's a really, really fun. It's a war worth fighting. How do you think from the early days when you were getting these glass door reviews to today, how have you improved then as a leader? Number one, I care about the glass door reviews less. Number two is I interact with fewer people. So actually, now that you're building a leadership team, I don't work with 120 people. I actually work with 20 people. And 100 people, I just assume they're having a good time or I assume that they're working. And this is where the trust comes in. 
So, so it becomes much easier. And I choose the 20 people that I can work with and we have a good working relationship. So if I don't have a good working relationship with somebody, oftentimes I don't work with them directly. And, so, and that's good for them and it's good for me. And I, I think it's eventually at some point in three years or four years, I will be less operational and I'll just be responsible for three things. Making sure the company has enough money, uh, making sure that we're hiring people, and then making sure the culture stays the same. And you'd be surprised. And this is something for people to really, uh, I don't know if this is relevant to people, but when you have a group of 10 people and you bring an 11th person, that 11th person has the power to change the entire culture of the 10 people. It's like putting a bad apple in a group of good apples, or it's kind of like putting a good apple in a group of bad apple. The, the network effect is massive. So we got to be very careful every time we add a, another person because they're going to come with their own culture, their own way of doing things. How can you spot a bad apple? Ooh, how do you spot a bad apple? That's tough. That's tough. Like when someone is not, when you can just, can you tell instantly that someone's not going to abide by those pillars? Or have you ever had cases where it takes 12 months, 18 months to find this bad apple? So usually you can tell who's a bad apple within the first month. Now. When does the bad apple leave the company? If the bad apple is not talented, it's usually out the, it's, it usually leaves the company within a month. If the bad apple is really talented, and that's where it gets really difficult, right? This person is not a culture fit, but he's such a good video maker or engineer. Usually the bad apple can buy itself time, like six months, but then eventually we'll have to separate ways. So I found that culture fit is the best long-term solution for career growth in our company as opposed to uh, talent or, you know, whatever. What about on the other side? How are you finding the stars? Like those 20 people that actually get to interact with you and you surround yourself with, how do you identify those people? It's like, how do you find a gold nugget in, in a river? <laughs> you go through a lot of nuggets. And by the way, the, the other 100 people are also talented. It's just impossible for me to work with more than 20. So just to be clear, it's not like the other 100 are not talented. So I think everybody's talented. My job is to find the diamond in the rough. And if I can find a diamond that no other company will find, that Facebook will not hire, Google will not hire, right? that no one will take a chance at, but we think something is there and we'll take a chance at them. And one out of five times, we hit the jackpot. That's a diamond. And we keep that diamond for as many years as possible. We love diamonds. I found two diamonds at a, at, a, at a Korean restaurant. They used to be waiters at a Korean barbecue restaurant, 20 years old. I found another diamond who was just a fresh grad. Now she's my head of video. I found another diamond who lives in a small uh, Philippines island. She's 19 years old, right? She has no education, dropped out of school, nothing, nothing. And, and she's a great video editor. So you know, across the company, we have many, many tens of diamonds and no one can steal them from me. So what's your advice then for content creators who are just starting off? If, they, if their one goal is to make the most amount of money in the social media space, what should they be doing? Well, number one, I mean, you should target high, you should, you should target like rich countries. If you target America, you make 10 times more than we do, for example. So uh, you know, our, our, our audience is very global. So out of the 50 million, 4 million are in America and then 46 million are not in America. You know, that, so you could target high revenue countries. You could also, um, you know, focus on brand deals. Look, any creator with a million followers can have an amazing life. Nobody should feel bad for them, especially if the million followers are on YouTube or Facebook. They'll make enough money. Like Nas Daily has graduated employees or teammates who became, made millions of dollars from being creators. So I think they'll be fine. The question is, what do you do when you're 10,000 followers? That's a harder one. You know, brand deals will help. Build a small knit community. Use our product to build your community. <laughs> and then that can help you monetize and finding the right 1,000 people to support you along the way. So that would be my second advice. What has been to you the downside of becoming such an influential person with over 50 million followers. The downside of being famous. Yeah, because I think I see it. Like you have a very different level of fame. 
that I've never experienced before where you really, I mean, you can't go out in public without being recognized. The downside of fame is sometimes you feel like you have to live 24 seven in an act, putting on an act, you know, like behaving a certain way, doing things a certain way. Right. And sometimes it can be a little bit limiting. Now I understand why actors like privacy. At some point, you know, if we meet each other and I'm a big fan of you, I'll come to you and it's my first interaction with you. And I'll say, I love your videos. I am from XYZ. I like to take a picture with you. I love you. So that's my, that's interaction is positive for me because it's my first time, but it will be your 500,000th time. And so it, it really follows the same structure. I love your videos. I'm from X country. Can I take a picture with you? Thank you so much. What are you up to? Right? And so I've had that conversation many, many times. Now it's amazing and I'm so humbled by it. But at some point I've noticed it's getting harder to have the same conversation. <laughs> so if somebody sees me on the street, please start the conversation with something different. Say, I hate your videos. <laughs> this is why. And I'd like a response. That could be interesting. Have you had someone do that? No, nobody's ever done that. Please. <laughs> somebody, somebody, somebody come to me and say, I hate your videos for the following reason. This is why. And I think that would be a good conversation. So sometimes when you're, when, you're, when you're public, when you're famous, you feel like you have a lot of shallow level conversation with thousands of people. No, I like that. Actually, I, I really like that. But sometimes you miss a little bit of depth. And uh, depth can be hard to find. How has it affected you mentally? Do you feel happier today than you were when you before you started content creation? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Anybody that claims otherwise, I disagree with. Yeah, I have millions of dollars, <laughs> Erica. I am a millionaire. That is insanity. Like I'm 30. I made the most money out of everybody in my family. The history of my family. Yes. It's but amazing. you don't really spend your money. Like you wear the same shirt every day. You no, but the, what I can do with the money theoretically is amazing. So I definitely most wholeheartedly am better off by creating content. And I think wholeheartedly the world is better off by being able to amplify the stories of this kid over here and that person over there and that person over there. You know, our content has changed people's lives, not the viewers the people we make videos about, the organizations we make videos about. It's the most net positive thing I've ever seen in my life. But you have these down days, right? Like I, I want to get into how you're actually feeling because I've been in the content creation space for a much shorter time and it has impacted me. Like, like in, how did it impact you? It's a lot of extra pressure that I didn't have before. It's a lot of opinions about me that I didn't have before. And... <laughs> <laughs> it does. It impacts your mental health. And I feel like it's not genuine to say otherwise, right? That's true. That is true. Yeah. So I agree with that. Uh, definitely did impact my mental health. You know, I would say my mental health was also just as bad as it is now before creating content. Like I've, I've never been the kind of guy who was normal. That being said, it is not normal to hear 100,000 people say that you suck. It's just not normal. It's not normal for you to interact with, you know, uh, uh, somebody who disagrees that with women's rights, you know, things that women should be in the kitchen. It's not normal to interact with these people every day because you've sheltered yourself from them, right? So with the internet, I really see the dark side of humanity and I hate it. Now, it sucks. How do you think having a partner who's also a content creator, and you met her quite early on in the thousand videos phase, how do you think that has helped you to succeed? My, the way I think about relationships or the relationship I want to be part of is one, I would like to be with somebody who's independent. So they must be independent in the sense of like, they make their own money, they figure out what to do in their lives by themselves without me being there. It's really important. <laughs> and if they figure, and she figured out a way how to make her own money, that's great. Uh, I still pay for most of our expenses, but just because I want to, not because I need to. So that's one. So independence is key for, for me in life. Uh, but second thing is, I think it's been very helpful in you know, getting somebody to understand all the problems with content. 
and understand what it feels like to create content and not make this a, a lonely journey. You know, I think one of the hardest things about content creation is that it's lonely. Um, and when you have somebody, your significant other, who understands that world as in that in that world, it becomes a little bit less lonely. Now, you know, when we're creating content together, you know, it it was not as lonely. But now we're taking slightly separate ways. If I'm building a business, and you know, she's she's not necessarily building a business like with many employees. So now slightly, it's it's a little bit different. So it's a little bit more lonely now, right? But ideally would like to work on fixing that and making it less lonely in, in, the, in the future. So, so not all relationships are rosy, but I think during that thousand day, it was very stressful, but it was not lonely. You know, one big thing with people like us is burnout. And I worry that for me too, like I'm not prioritizing my mental health. I'm not prioritizing my physical health. At some point, I am the type of person where because I'm so extreme and intense about everything I do, like you know, last night I was working till 6 a.m., the night before 4 a.m., you know, I am going to burn out at some point again. And my life has been like that. Like I work extremely hard because I don't know how to do a middle ground and then I burn out. And then I take a two-month breather and then I start over again. Um, the idea crosses my mind once a week, no more than that. So I think I'm far from burning out. Um, I think I have five years left in me. I really hope I do. <laughs> You said earlier, ten. You need ten years. So five so. years, create like a maniac, and then five years, you know, nine to five, chill kind of guy, chill kind of boss. Do you think you're capable of that? Just relaxing and having a very mellow life. You know, we didn't go enough into like the background. Your background shapes who you are. Your half Japanese background shapes who you are in this conversation. You know, my Israeli Palestinian background shapes who I am until I die. You know, I don't think. I don't think much will change. You know, I, I think most things in life are meaningless. And I found two things that have meaning. And I'm just going to do this for the rest of my life. That's it. It's only two things that are meaningful. What are the two things? The mission and the mission. <laughs> <laughs> Is that really? Were those your two things? See, I don't find meaning even in personal pleasure. I don't find meaning in even me dressing nicely. But I don't, it's just not, I don't want to be guilted into becoming somebody that I'm not. Right? And this is so important, even for you, for my relationship, for my family. I don't want you to guilt me into telling me, no, you should care about these specific people. You should care about having a nice little life and, and, and relaxing uh, with your girlfriend or boyfriend. No, right? I, I found something that I think is really meaningful. Maybe I'll change in five years, 10 years. But for now, you know, it's, I'm as open of a book as I can be. And that's fair. I respect that. What is it about your background that made you like that? You know, growing up between two people that hate the existence of each other makes you think deeply about what matters. Makes you think like, you know, to this day, people are losing their life over a piece of land. To this day, people are dying because they're born Jewish. It's insane. I, I think that is, that is the fundamental thing we all need to talk about forever until that doesn't happen anymore. People are still dying because they're born in Palestine, for example. It's equally, equally terrible. I don't know. I just can't get that out of my head. I can't get that out of my head. I don't know why. I don't think I'll enjoy living in the mountains of the Alps of Switzerland and having a nice little retirement life because it's not meaningful. So, uh, and neither is, you know, neither is, you know, spending 80% of your time with your partner, right? Uh, spending time with your girlfriend or boyfriend, whatever it is, and just enjoying your life. That's not the life I wanted signed up for. And Aline knows that. My girlfriend knows that. This is not the life we signed up for. And, you know, we're just, we're just getting started. I respect a lot of that. Like, I think that you are right that you should not be judged into being someone else. Someone you're not, yeah. Someone you're not. And that is something very cool about you. Like, I feel like you are 100% yourself, 100% authentic to what you believe in. I think that you are authentic in a way that even I feel like I'm not. And this is about my background, too. Like, the Japanese side of me, for sure, you can't talk about emotions. You can't, you can't be as, you can never be 100% yourself with the Japanese side of me. And mm. while the American side of me is yeah. very independent and outgoing and all yeah. of that, like there's a balance to me. And I feel like because of that, I'm not, I am never comfortable being 100% myself. Yet. Yet. When you're angry enough, you, you eventually you will be your, unapologet unapologetically yourself. And it'll be a very freeing feeling, even if it means hurting the people around you, 
but I do want everybody to be unapologetic for themselves. And that's how you know who are the true people that should be in a relationship together and who should not. But what does that mean, though? If being unapologetically yourself hurts people around you, does that speak to the people who are around you? Does that speak to you? Like, I feel like people, I feel like you should be unapologetically yourself and that shouldn't hurt the people around you. That, does that mean you've surrounded yourself with the, the wrong people or? There's no such thing. If somebody is truly unapologetically themselves and is not hurting anybody, I think something is off. Even in the stupidest things like taking a shower. <laughs> somebody doesn't like taking, it likes to smell. Uh, you know, they will just hurt the people around them with their smell. <laughs> And it's, you know, I've seen far, this is my childhood all over again. I've seen, far, I've seen far too many relationships in which people bend over to suit somebody else that they lose a sense of who they are and they spend their entire life not being what they want. Specifically women and men, right? Women get in a marriage in my community and they can never escape it because you can never get a divorce. It's simply not an option. Society will shun you. Right. So I've seen it when people are not who they truly are, living life waiting to die. You know, my aunts, my uncles, my family, every single person I know in my community is not being who they truly want to be. That's why I'm so confident in being what I want to be and being very transparent about it with my girlfriend and my significant other. And if this personality, you like this personality and you should be who you want to be. And if we are a match, then we'll be forever together. If we're not a match, it's okay. And I think we are who we truly want to be and we are together. Now, if she is not being who she really wants to be, then that's a much larger problem. You should read, you should read this book, just the title of it. It's called The Courage to Be Disliked. People value authenticity over agree, ag agreeing with you all the time. As long as they think you're living your truth, Hey man, you be you. Sure, but I think you can be authentic and agreeable. Like I don't think everything has to be a conflict. I very rarely have conflict. That's the in half life. Japanese in you talking. <laughs> the courage to be disliked means that when you live your truth, you realize that half the world will dislike your truth. And this goes to LGBTQ rights, this goes to women's rights, this goes to many rights. I'm living my truth. I I do understand that from this podcast. You know, maybe 50%, 70% of the comments will be like, screw this guy. That's okay. I've, I've come to live with it. So the courage to be disliked. And the minute you have that courage to be disliked, because it's not the need to be disliked. It's not the, they didn't say any other word. That's why I love this title. It takes courage to be disliked. I love it. For sure. I will say I don't have the courage to be disliked. When I do things, I'm thinking about is this agreeable to people? And that probably is the Japanese side of me. Wow. There was, That's the first thing you think. Let's say specifically for content creation. It should creation. be, is this agreeable to me? No, let's say specifically for content yeah. creation. There are definitely topics in the finance space that are very controversial. People have very strong opinions about it. One is, you know, when you get married, should you have separate bank accounts? I remember I made a video on that. I said what my opinion was, which, which is mine a, is you that should. you should have separate bank accounts. Yeah. People half the commenters were very, very angry about it. They were so upset that I would have the audacity to say that because they were like, well, then aren't you setting people up for divorce if you're saying before you even get married that you, you should have separate bank accounts? Yeah, makes sense. And I didn't like that feeling of getting attacked on one side. So what, did you make any other video like that after? No, that was my last, oh my God. last kind of controversial video. <laughs> Come on, Eric, after this podcast, you have to do something that's like, unagreeable. Then I just don't think I can reach as many people. That's not true. Categorically not true. I do believe you can reach way more people by being who you truly are than by pretending to be somebody else you're not. Best example is Elon Musk. Elon Musk is a CEO that I completely hate, but I so respect because he's who he's living his truth. And that's why he has a hundred million followers. Do you know who the CEO of Ford is? Ain't nobody knows who that is. And also their Twitter is probably dead. Nobody cares about what they think because they know they're not being who they truly are. They're talking corporate. They're thinking corporate. They're tweeting corporate. They're, they're putting on an act. They're acting to the world what they're supposed to be. That is a terrible world where all of us are acting to each other, virtue signaling to each other that we know something or two. That is why we started making videos. 
because I don't like that. This is who I am, and 52 million people seem to like it, which is a lot more than my 2,000 friends before I became who I truly was. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for the record, I, I do think I'm authentic on social media, but I am strategic. I am not going to, at this stage where I am right now, I'm not going to create polarizing videos that will polarize half my audience. It takes time. Eventually, you'll do it. It takes time. The most polarizing thing I said was about Israel and Palestine is that actually, you know, we're kind of in the middle. We're not with either. And that was really polarizing to both. Uh, eventually, I think, you know, three, four, five years down the line, when you see the common section and when you realize it is practically impossible to, to, to please 100% of your audience, you will start to give up on percentage of, you, of percentages of your audience and you will start making uh, content that's slightly controversial. I wouldn't say polarizing. Finance is not polarizing. Controversial is a better word. Also, you're doing finance content. You're not a political analyst. How controversial could you be? <laughs> There's no life or death situation here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's the question for you. Pick one for the box. What is your worst childhood memory about finances? <laughs> I was saving money in my, in my trophy. I had a trophy and I was saving money and then I saved $30 in it, $40 in it because I'm very cheap. Since I was like 10 years old, I've been very cheap. I don't spend it myself. I don't like spending money. And I've been saving it, this $30 and my brother is not cheap at all. My brother, if he has money, he spends it because he knows more money will come in the future. Somehow, some way, he has that confidence. I don't. And so I have this immigrant mentality that tomorrow will be $0. Um, and, you know, I was saving $30 in my trophy and he went and took them. He took them away from me and he spent it. And I thought that was, you know, disastrous. I, I, was, I felt backstabbed, betrayed. It was, it was really disastrous for me. So maybe that shaped a little bit about sort of my finances and how I think about finances as a, a very private thing. I can talk about it publicly, but it's a very private thing. No shared bank accounts, uh, no marriage bank accounts. No shared family businesses, none. I control this money uh, because maybe of that, of that uh, childhood. Um, what was your family money situation growing up? Middle class. Middle class. Yeah, we were not poor, but we were not rich. Good middle class. When did you forgive your brother for that? <laughs> yeah, I'm a, who's interviewing? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't, I mean, I'm friends with my brother and we talk. I don't think I've actually forgiven him for that. It's like a joke thing now, but I actually, I would like, there's no forgiving. I would like to say thank you. Thank you for teaching me an amazing lesson because I saw there's a concept called tragedy of the commons. Do you know what that is? Vaguely remember the word, but I don't remember what it meant. It's basically when like in Africa, the hunters in Africa, you know, you have 1000 elephants, but the 1000 elephants belong to everybody. It's a common thing. But every hunter says, oh, there's 1,000 elephants there. I can go and hunt two elephants for myself. And the next hunter says, oh, there's 1,000 elephants. I can hunt five elephants for myself. And then every hunter thinks about their personal gain because there's this common resource, elephants. Before you know it, elephants go extinct. Tragedy of the commons. Tragedy of something that is so common. And this is how I think about finances as well, especially in family businesses. When there's a, a lot of a pool of money that everybody thinks they have access to, Everybody will act in a selfish way to suit their interest. And that's how corruption happens at governments. That's how corruption happens at corporations or whatever. So I'm very mindful of the tragedy of the commons. And I find my finances are very private. Nobody touches them. And I'm not doing business with friends. And I'm not doing business with family. I only do business with professional investors in which there is, you know, uh, complete understanding of the relationship. And that, you know, I'd like to continue that as long as possible. Your mindset with money, the what you were talking about with this, it's almost a scarcity mindset where you have to protect, you have yeah. to guard it, right? Yeah. If, hypothetically, if we were, if you were to get sued today and all of your money is gone, you think you could build it back up to where it is? Yes. Why? Because I have proven that the way I talk resonates with more than 10 people, right? The way you talk resonates with tens of millions of people. And nobody can take that from you. The way you talk and the way you think and the way you tell stories, it's, it's actually, it's unstealable. So even if I'm back to zero, you know what I'm going to do? <laughs> I'm going to buy a phone, I'm going to buy a camera, and I'm going to make a thousand videos again 
and I'm going to get the same millions of followers. And that, so I have an abundance mindset in the sense that, in the sense that it's going to be difficult for me to be poor unless I killed somebody. That being said, when it comes to money, I do have a scarcity mindset. Uh, you know, I have that immigrant chip on the shoulder in which people that look like me, people that, that, that have the same race as me don't deserve to have that, that much money. And eventually with enough time, the pendulum is going to swing to the West. The pendulum is going to swing to the better looking person, is going to swing to the white person, is going to swing to the people with the institutional advantage. And it's just going to be taken away from me, even despite all the success. So I do believe I don't deserve any of the money that I get. Um, and I do believe at some point it will just go dry. And you know, I wish there was a remedy. But then you'll always be able to replenish that. But I'll always be able to replenish that. But the minute I replenish it, so it's very contradictory. The minute I replenish that, I will, it will stop at some point. And then I have to start again. So it, it, it almost feels like going in waves, you know, cycles. I will be rich and then I'll be super poor. Then I'll be rich, then I'll be super poor. So I want to really make sure I'm not ever going super poor. Do you really think that's that's going to be happening? Like I, I very much see that from knowing you, it's just going to be a clear path up. And then maybe once your company goes public, it'll be a shot up here. And then we're not 100 percent. I'm not 100 percent logical all the time, as yeah. you probably noticed. So, uh, you know, there's a little bit of irrationality in the way I think about things. Do you have money goals? Like, do you have a set net worth you'd like to hit? Yeah. And where are you right now, generally? I actually don't know how much I'm worth now. I, I should, it, I've, I've realized it's very difficult to know that number because you have money in like 13 different bank accounts and money for company, personal, non-company is very complicated. I think I'm at eight. I think so I'm 8% eight of the million, way there. million, by the way, for the audience members, <laughs> not 8,000. Eight bucks, as, this, as the <laughs> investors, say, investors say bucks, not millions. <laughs> and I, I'd like to get to a hundred. Uh, why a hundred? Because I'd like to take, I would like to take like, a $70 million risk, or I'd like to take a $70 million bet. I'm really excited to do that. So I want to build up my war chest so big. And then eventually I want to go to war for one thing with $70 million and see what happens. With your current, let's say $8 million, do you have any tolerance for risk? Maybe like lose a million max. I'm still very risk averse. Like I'm still very like scared. Um, I have 10% in crypto or maybe 5% in crypto and 5% or like 30, 40% in the stock market or whatever. But my risk tolerance is low still. Do you think that's the immigrant mentality again? Yeah. I also think I have the same thing. I have a low risk tolerance when it comes to money. That's why you should get investors because investors professionally force you to have a high risk tolerance. But what's very funny is you love control. To me, getting investors is giving up so much for your control. Like to be honest, with NOS.io, you are not working for yourself. It is not your company. It belongs to the investors. And it's surprising yeah. that knowing you, your personality, how you love control, it's surprising that you would do that because now for the next 10 years, you are working for them. Great point. <laughs> I love control as long and I'm willing to give up some of my company because it benefits everybody. This is, again, it goes back to like Nas Daily benefiting everybody around me. So the way I'm structuring the company, I still have absolute control. So getting an investor doesn't mean that you're getting a boss. And I think it's important we tell the world about this and educate the world. There's nothing wrong with investors. In fact, investors don't want control. They're like, what do I want to do with this company? I gave you the money, so you're the boss. So you take the decisions. I'm just there to support. So I still have board control. I still have voting shareholder control. I still have majority control. So actually, all I'm doing is I have full control, but I'm also sharing the wealth with my team and with investors. So we've given up a quarter of the company for the team, and we've given up another quarter for the investors. So I own half, and everybody else owns half. And I don't feel like it's not my company, because anybody that works with you should benefit as long as you benefit too. Pareto efficiency. It's the same as in companies. It's the same as in relationships. You must benefit by being my friend or working in my company. It shouldn't just be me and getting you know slave labor or whatever that is. So that's how I live my life. Do you think you're going to be ever, I mean, eventually, if you're going to continue to expand, you're going to get diluted to a place where you don't own 50%, I imagine? Yeah, as long as I have control of the board. That's it. That's what I'm at. If I have 1%, I mean, I, I'm not going to get to that. But even if it ends up with me owning 2%, it doesn't matter. I mean, it matters, but it's not the end of the world. What matters is that 
I can direct the ship wherever I think it should go. The last thing I want is somebody who doesn't care about the mission as much as I do to take this ship to the wrong direction. It all matters. Was that a hard decision for you, whether to bootstrap and use your own funding to fund the company versus take on outside investor money? It's a difficult decision, but the most difficult decision is what do I spend their money on? That's actually the difficult decision. When somebody gives you $10 million and says, spend it, <laughs> what are you going to do? Actually, spending investor money is more difficult. Knowing how to spend investor money is more difficult than actually getting it because you need to spend it on something that scales, not on yachts or outings or whatever. So when we went to investors, we said, okay, this is working. We want more money to do exactly this. Give it to us. And that's really important. So what did you say specifically? What was I want to get 15 more engineers. I want to give creators a minimum revenue guarantee. I want to build the technology and I want to grow our revenue by 3x. But for that, I have to spend five, $10 million. Can I please have the money? I said, yeah, take it. <laughs> I make it sound easy, but it's pretty hard. When you first started the thousand days of video creation, if someone were to have asked you, where do you want your life to be in five years? What would you have said? A million followers, a million dollars traveling around the world. How long did it take to achieve that? The million followers? 400 days. A million dollars? Uh, 1,000 days. 1,000 days? It took a while. I mean, it's a lot of time. It's, it's, it's short. No, time. that's it's short. short. That's... No, but I had 10 million followers. You know, I was actually one of the poorest creators. Like anybody in the world with 10 million followers has $10 million, especially in America. But I am one of the poorest creators with this scale just because I just didn't prioritize money in that thousand day journey. But you wouldn't go back and do it differently. Would you no, have no. prioritized money? No, 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 not at all. I loved it. No, I, we, would, we would always not put ads. Like we would turn off ads from our videos. We would, I said no to $50,000 when I only had $100,000. I said no to fifty thousand dollar one day deal just because it didn't align with the mission and yeah so I probably said no to like three hundred four hundred k um, in that thousand day journey and I don't uh, like I don't regret it because again the mission above all okay so you achieved what you would have said you wanted to achieve which is amazing today I'll ask you and five years from now we'll be like did you achieve it what do you want to have happen in five years where do you I want, want to be? a unicorn company. That's worth a billion dollars. Uh, not for the money, because it signifies something else. I want to be the first Palestinian Israeli to build a unicorn in Israel. Israel has 79 unicorns, all created by Jewish Israelis. I think we should create one. So that's one. And I'd like to have a thousand people working and believing in the mission. Uh, so that's my goal for the next five years. Amazing. And this is actually the true final question. So the podcast is called Erica Taught Me. I want... People to be able to walk away today and say, Nisire taught me. What do you want them to say? Nisire taught me that it's okay to be disliked. I love it. Thank you. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I hope you enjoyed. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, it would mean a lot if you can take a moment to leave a review for the podcast. It really helps support the work that we're doing. Thank you for spending your time with me today, and I'll talk to you next Tuesday on a brand new episode of Erica Taught Me.